the Mormon trail really lit a fire here of history. You know, people are just all of a sudden really willing to learn history. You guys are right on as far as the path that they took out of the winter quarters. This would coincide with everything that they've talked about. This, this is it here. This is, this is living history, guys. With everything in readiness, the command is given, and our 60 wagons are on the way. And we could sing. We've left the realms of safety. We were stopped once by the Indians. There were a thousand of them. They could have easily killed us all. July the 5th. We were camped on a small stream called Gooseneck Creek. It was here my sister Mary Louise was born. A meeting was held. It was decided we could go no further. The snow so deep and no food. We were doomed to starvation. While many may say our toil was in vain to, to enter, enter such, such a desolate land, land someday, someday this journey, journey will be remembered as, as our legacy west. As if in the magic of a time machine, with each trodden step, each revolution of a wheel, the passengers of this trek are transported back 150 years. Modern circumstances don't allow them to exactly relive the experience, but it can be wholeheartedly reenacted. It's as if there's a silent invitation from the past to come and be a part of this modern experience, to feel a portion of what they must have felt, to think the thoughts which occupied their minds. There's a reality to it. There's a reality to being on the ground. I think that uh, I think the trail has a memory all its own as well. And I think that, that walking the ground or riding the ground tends to begin to transfer a little bit of that. I think you can read a whole lot about it, but, uh, but until you, you bend down and, uh, and feel the earth and, uh, and walk upon it, uh, the experience doesn't quite transfer. You bet we are. 4.30 in the morning, we're very popular. Popular enough that someone would like to put a bullet between our eyes. <laughs> At 5 o'clock each morning, the bugle was heard. The people of the company were to arise, say their morning prayers, feed themselves and their teams. Our Father, which art in heaven, we bow our heads before you this morning to express our gratitude and thanks to thee for this beautiful day. Another bugle was then sounded at 7 o'clock, which was the signal for the company to be off. In the evening, the bugle would sound at 8.30 for evening prayers, and by 9 o'clock, the camp would rest for the night. It was our practice not to travel on Sundays, and even settlers on other trails found it wise to follow our example. They would find soon enough that resting the company and the animals one day a week would make their trek run more efficiently. One of the roughest things I ever had to do is sleep in this rain with wet socks, <laughs> soaking wet and muddy feet. But I'll survive, especially if I hear some good stories on the trail today. We're walking down the street, and pioneers didn't have roads back then. But when we would go on dirt roads, it does feel like we're pioneers. Oh, and also they had oxen instead of horses. Oh, and they didn't have braces, see? Get out of the way. The Vanguard Expedition incorporated people of varied ages, races, religions, and occupations. Stonecutters, farmers, carpenters, architects, clerks, coopers, blacksmiths. Most left families behind with the purpose of cutting a preliminary path across America. In a similar way, the reenactment train has attracted people from all around the world, from Asia, Europe, and over North America. People from various religions and occupations joined together in a common goal of discovering the secrets of the trail and bridging the years which separate them from ancestors or heroes gone before. I've done a lot of wagon trains, this is my fifth. And so I decided to get a head start this morning and enjoy some of the lovely countryside, walk at my own pace, 
enjoy the rain, <laughs> makes me feel at home, and uh, just take my time and have a nice stroll. And I just love what the pioneers did. I think it was great. We've nothing quite like it in England. And you've got such beautiful countryside and wide open spaces that we don't get in England. And I love the wagon train people, the camaraderie and the friendship. You make very good friends and they last such a long time. I'm here by myself, but I'm not single, I'm married and I have three grown up children and a granddaughter back in England. It's not everyone's kind of holiday, but I just love it. I mean, those, those women and those families that did this all those years ago, they were just like us. They were just women and they were just families. And it's nice to know how they felt and how they did this. And the only way that you can tell how they did this is to go out and do it. And this is the best way for me. And some of their life stories and their life histories they're just so amazing and it's quite humbling the experiences that they had on this trail and at least I hope that no one's going to die on this trail like they did. The Vanguard Expedition of 1847 had no official send-off. Though some of the wagons left winter quarters as early as April 5th, the entire group was not officially underway until April 15th. The return of missionaries from foreign lands and the need to raise money and prepare wagons delayed their departure. For the reenactment trek, Fremont was reached after three full days of travel. Having left Omaha on Monday the 21st, the modern team had its start almost a week behind the original Vanguard expedition of 1847. Within the first week, the modern travelers crossed the Elkhorn River into the city of Fremont. From Fremont into North Bend, then along the Platte River into the town of Schuyler, and from Schuyler, up the Loop River into the city of Columbus. Oh, I got a muddy! Hi, Hi. Hi. Well, so the kids are familiar with Nebraska history, and so this was so close to where we teach and where the kids live, we felt it was part of their background and tradition that they come out and see this. We planned to walk about a mile, but we're already into the second mile, so I think we're gonna stop after about two miles. I don't think any one particular people own it, but, uh, but it is there and it is real. And, uh, and the reality of that becomes more clear as we, as we travel along it. When I first moved to this farm, I've been out here pheasant hunting, and I noticed that the little bumps that I would walk across looked to me like a, a poor example of a terrace. And the more I studied and the more I I read about the geography of this area. It became apparent to me that what I was actually walking across was some type of ruts that were here for a reason. And studying the Mormon trail books, that they had actually come across this hillside here from the, all accounts in the diary and had terraced this hill. You guys, you gotta remember this was back in 1847 and this was virtual prairie. These trees weren't here. It was April 7th, 1847. It was muddy. There was still some snow on the ground from all accounts in the diary. And they more or less took the easiest route they possibly could. And it wasn't in single file because the, the mud was so bad they had to more or less travel side by side or even further than that. Thinking back on what it was like and watching those wagons, I could just imagine doing it myself. It'd be a little a little work, I think, traveling in the mud and the snow and in the rain. I don't know if I would want to do it and be a pioneer. It's uh, definitely a lot of work. You can see by the ruts that they were pushing some mud up here, guys. I am a living part of this trail. It's on my property and I own it. And this is history right here in the making. You know, these, these ruts are gonna be here. They've been here for 150 years. We're going to be here for another 150 years if the land's taken care of and not developed.
The members of the Mormon faith, having been pushed from city to city and from state to state, were not unfamiliar with adversity. The philosophy they had embraced taught them that tribulation would precede the blessings they desired. Now, as travelers on the great American plains, they learned there would be plenty of testing times. Even early in the first week of the reenactment trek, the company realized that they too would not be without their challenges. That much? And more. You wanted to get better, or you wanted to just tease her? You, no, I'm just being facetious, but when you go after something like this, you go after it. This is not unusual. We run into it, and you don't like to run into it when you got this many horses together. Because this is a very, very... Uh, What's your name? I can't find the word right now, but we have a little problem with this. Is it contagious? Uh, other horses can get the disease very easily. You'd recommend when you got one like this that you water it in a separate water trough so the other trough, so the other horses don't get exposed. What I was trying to say is very contagious. Oh, there it was. There it is. Yeah. An x-ray would be good, but it's not critical emergency. For a 60-year-old man, I'm all right. I'm in good shape for the shape I'm in. What happened with your horse? My horse rolled over backwards on me, rolled, reared up, went over on me. He just came right over on top of me and slapped me to the ground, pinned my left side under. The worst thing is I got dirty. Okay, what we need is you broke three ribs? Yeah, I got I, a clavicle, uh, the scapula, and uh, some ribs. Oh, man. And they've got you now in a harness? I'm in a harness. Uh, they were going to do surgery on me. Uh, to do what? To replace the sca repair the scapula, uh, President uh, Sorensen, President Hill, and a couple of brethren gave me a blessing yesterday. When we went back to meet the orthopedic surgeon for surgery, they couldn't find the break, and they put me in a harness and sent me home. Did the original X-rays show a break yes. in the scapula? In the yes. Yes, there were three doctors that looked at those. I exhorted the brethren to prayer and faithfulness and warned them the persecutions were not ended. I knew that traders and preachers were stirring up the Indians to harass us, to steal our horses and supplies, but I promised them there would be safety only if rules were faithfully obeyed. First time out with a handcart, we're gonna see if it'll work. My wife's ancestors made the trip. My ancestors built the railroad, so. A little different type of pioneer. They came over from England and and immigrated, and they, my great great grandfather was the first one over, and he worked on the railroad and sent money back for the rest of the family. So, 1860s, they they made their way across these plains. On April 10th of 1847, the Vanguard Company reached the Elkhorn River. This was to be their first major obstacle. The horses and cattle were ridden through the water, which at the time was about four feet deep and 50 yards wide. A raft, wisely built by an advance party, was used in ferrying the wagons to the opposite shore. Even as night fell, the company was still divided by the river, and guards were posted in both camps to keep a watchful eye on cattle, horses, and supplies. Today, the reenactment company crosses easily over a sturdy bridge. The cross took all of six minutes. thing is that as the Mormon trail came out at some key points they would set up a pole and put a flag on it a white flag on it they, it was symbolic but it also served then
to mark the spot for later groups that came out. Because you see, this was a, a rallying point because it's here that the river turns west. Anybody else? A flag! The communities along the Mormon Trail have anticipated the coming of the wagon train, often having planned historical awareness activities to accompany the arrival. The enthusiasm of the trek visibly spreads itself into the citizens of each community. The Mormon Trail really lit a fire here of history. You know, people are just all of a sudden really willing to learn history. Before, you know, it was eh, kind of a boring thing to do, but now it seems like it's really revived the interest locally, and we just love it. And so we felt it was a prime opportunity to have a grand opening. Since we'd have thousands of people in town anyway, <laughs> we hope for at least a couple dozen. And as you can see, we got far more than that. This is a modern hand cart. It's a uh, reproduction of one of the ones that was lost uh, in the records and diaries of some of our ancestors. But we're sure it existed, so. <laughs> and a little boy. One of the most unique inventions of the Mormon Trail was the handcart. Though there were no handcarts in the first expeditions of 1847, between 1856 and 1860, some 3,500 settlers would cross the plains pulling handcarts. Out of the 10 companies that left winter quarters, eight arrived safely in the Salt Lake Valley. The effort proved to be a financial success, saving the poor immigrants the costs of wagons, horses, and oxen. In our reenactment expedition, 20 people have chosen to cross these same plains pulling handcarts. At times, as many as 250 have assisted in the effort, but only 20 have committed to go all the way, from Omaha to Salt Lake City. As we go marching up the hill, so merrily on our way we go until we reach the valley. keep a pace that might be slower than what you want to do. You're all pretty fresh, but we still have to keep a fairly slow pace um, for a lot of us that have been going for a while and they got to keep going. The hand cards they pulled back then were 700 pounds. We got 200 pound hand cards that and we don't really nearly reach that, but yet we got a bunch of us on there. It's, it's tough. It's, you, you learn a feel for what they actually went through. Uh, just because everyone else is just kind of, they're in pain. Well, no, I'm just, I just feel like I've got, I'm able to do this. And it's fun. I came out here to go with my friends for a few days, but I liked it so much that I decided to stay, so I'm going to be for a month. Yeah, it's exciting. As you sacrifice, you begin to understand the great movement of the church that has caused it to grow and grow and grow. And that sacrifice helps you to understand the importance of the trail as a great growing up period for the church, where people understood that though they sacrificed, their lives were not less, their lives were greater, and their understanding and their joy was greater. When we were picking up papers for this trip, my dad ran over my foot because the mirror was sticking out and I hit my head and I fell on the ground and the car backed over my foot and it's doing great. She was going to represent Alice Clegg, who is a great-grandmother, 
and um, she was nine when she crossed the uh, plains, also the same age as Heather. That's who she's representing. We have several ancestors that um, we are representing as we walk, and some with hand carts with the Martin Hand Cart Company and others. And so we wanted to walk every step. Grandma was 10 years of age and remembers the awful suffering they endured because of cold hunger and scarcity of clothing. She saw many die along the way. When the food got scarce, she remembers her mother making small cakes for the children, telling them to suck them so they wouldn't get so hungry. Also that the sleet would wet their clothing and the wind was so cold that their dresses would freeze still as they trudged along. She helped her brother William pull a handcart all the way. When they camped for the night, they pulled their carts in a circle and made their beds inside the circle for protection. One night, Grandma's hair got off the bed. When morning came, it was frozen to the ground. Her mother warmed some water and thawed it out so she could get up. Many had frozen hands and feet as they struggled on, pulling their carts and trusting God. The gift of our forebears was more than merely a trail across America. It was more than mere pioneering, more than cutting a road or discovering a new land or building a home. Their march, their toils, their struggles were replete with hope. Though they literally walked through the valleys of the shadow of death, their faith, zeal, and courage inspire us to be unhindered in our efforts to start anew.